Well, my next guest is a Democrat who voted for the deal, but says that the cuts outlined are absolutely painful, and he only voted for that because uh, hitting the debt ceiling would have hurt a lot more. Connecticut Congressman Jim Hines joins me right now. Congressman, very good to have you. But again, I'm sorry, you know, despite your voting yay against your better wishes, uh, I know what you were saying about the alternative. Uh, but is it fair to say these cuts up front, which, by the way, very few are immediately up front, are that onerous that we shouldn't have even attempted them? No, of course not. And I would never say that. In fact, I've been telling people that, uh, you know, stand by because this deal over 10 years does $2.1 trillion. Most economists will tell you that over the next 10 years, we need to find $4 trillion. So we're just over halfway there. And if you thought this was bad, wait till we find the other $2 trillion. Now, that other $2 trillion presumably is going to include a talk about how we can change the tax code to both simplify and to help out here. Uh, but no, look, uh, anybody who's running around and saying this was too much or too brutal, stand by because we've got another $2, two trillion to come. And, Neil, to your point about the cuts made now, I think you would agree with me that given the hesitancy at best of this recovery, that we probably don't want to hammer it with huge cuts right now. That's what Simpson Bowles said. That's well, what the Gang I, I of Six said. we don't have to worry. I don't think that happened. Yeah, but, I mean, would you call for $200 billion in cuts in the midst of this staggering recovery? I, I don't think well, so. Well, I, I, I'll split the difference with you then. I see $21 billion. <laughs> you see $200 billion as a worry. And split the difference because this near-term cutting, Congressman, truth be told, isn't much cutting. No, and you're right. Look, the, di the difference in the budget after this deal in the next one year is actually going to be quite minor. But it is a change from where this Congress, uh, well, not this Congress, but where Congress pasts were, where, you know, it grew, everything grew 10 percent a year. So, hey, this is one step, uh, and there's other steps to come. But do you, you know, and you're pretty smart at this, and you know the numbers, and you've crunched them yourself, and we've talked about this. You know what we're facing. You know where we're going with entitlements, with everything else. And unless we take actions now to make what really could be just minor adjustments, uh, we're going to be facing a major problem. And it seems like, and this is where I will count Republicans as well, we're, 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 we're shirking that responsibility and that duty. Look, Tucker's right that the American people have not yet been conditioned to think through some changes that have to occur on the entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. We just haven't had that conversation honestly enough. Um, but most people in Congress would say, hey, I know that's where the bulk of the long-term problem lies. The question is, how do we fix it? Do we fix it the way Ryan suggested and just basically shift the costs onto seniors or onto states? Or do we have a different discussion about finding efficiencies in the health care system, you know, making choices that don't actually hurt our uh, seniors? That's, that's where the debate is. But you're right. Anybody who says we're not going to touch or even and talk about Medicare and Social Security is not focused on where the big problems are. Congressman, thank you very much. Good seeing you. All right. Thanks, Neil.